Before I begin uh, my sermon, I want to thank uh, Julie and Judy who represented you as your lay representatives during the Illinois Conference of the UCC annual celebration Friday and Saturday. So thank you for them for taking time out of their day to do that. I know that sometimes it's tedious because you sit there for a few hours. I had to wake up Judy yesterday night. And... But it is a lot of work. It's a lot of listening. And just like the annual meeting that most of the time, majority of you want to be done in less than an hour or so, that's not so for the annual celebration of the conference. That takes minimum two days. And that's because there's workshops in allowing for us to have some education and growth. And there's all the business and fiscal reports that go along with it. One of the important things that you will uh, find out if you're in tune with the Illinois Conference email uh, or newsletter is that yesterday we voted and passed where the two camps will now be officially their 501c3 on their own. They're their own entities. Uh, Tower Hill has actually been its own 501c3, but it's been operating under the Illinois Conference umbrella. Now, if for some reason either camp were to fail on its own, it would revert back to being owned by the conference. Um, and Community Renewal Society also has a stake in Tower Hill. So um, that would go back to them as well. And the plan is that we are to invest as a conference $300,000 into the camps for the next five years. And it's broken down starting with 50,000 for 2025, and then 40, 30, 20, and 10. So what the conference will be asking our congregations now will be lower. Um, but that's to encourage you all to also use those camps. I know Dr. Grice uses it annually at least with his family. So, and I know others do too. Uh, so keep that in mind. There are changes coming along into our conference. And if you're not in tune, I encourage you to be in tune with what's happening with your conference. Because the liability of the conference also affects us. We are part of the UCC. And we invest in that. That's part of what we do for the 5 for 5. It's to invest in the church itself. And a conference is part of the church. So I ask you to keep your prayers for all the leaders in our conference that have stepped forward to take on those roles, often working 20 to 30 hours, not paid, on top of their regular jobs, because a lot of them still do have full-time jobs, and they do that. And we save money by them doing that. So I want you to keep that in mind. I want to encourage you to find a way to be involved in the conference level because that is important, or even the association. Um, so, and if you're not aware, Reverend Molly Carlson has stepped down as our conference minister, so her term ended a little earlier because she was called to another conference. Um, so right now we have Reverend Tara Murr being our acting associate, uh, acting conference minister which means that our conference staff is short of one associate conference minister, which means three people are doing the job of four. And we also have a staff change in the conference office where they have one less staff member. So that's more work that they have to carry. So I ask for you to pray for our conference leadership, the staff and our ministerial team. In January, we will have Reverend Chanel uh, who is one of our newest associate conference minister for pastoral care. Uh, amazing individual. Um, she's been here for over a year in our conference, uh, but she has an extremely busy schedule. And so I've known her for years and I just met her in person Friday. So we served on the mental health board network together while she was in New York. So amazing person. She'll be here for Martin Luther King Sunday to preach for us. So I encourage you to be present and let her enjoy that warm welcome that you all always extend to everyone who comes to our doors. 
As we gather today to commemorate All Saints Day, we honor the lives and the legacy of those who have departed from our midst. With their unwavering faith, these remarkable individuals are beacons of light, guiding us on our spiritual journeys. Think about it. How many of you were inspired by your saints and how you look at spirituality, how you look at theology, how you look at church life, how you look at life? How are you as a human being? How did they mold you into some of that? Today, we delve into the profound story of Lazarus, a narrative that beautifully illustrates the transformative power of Christ. I want you to think of that, transformative power. Yesterday was also another one first for me. Our keynote speaker was Reverend Rina Ramos, and some of you over a year ago, we were in a Zoom call or a workshop with her that we held for our congregation. It was part of, uh, she was almost two years, because it was part of the Open and Affirming Wise process. And she's from El Salvador. Amazing, amazing woman. She's been in our national leadership, but she also pastors a church out of Oakland. And if you would have heard her story, you would know that the spirit transforms. She expressed how her immigration journey is almost like many of those who today come into our country. Not all of them, but when you're desperate for a better tomorrow. She was 14 years old. Imagine that, 14 years old. What were you doing at 14? Where she had to journey from El Salvador to the next country, to the next country. So her aunt could try to get them in here, into this country, undocumented. Now, this was in the 80s, when there was so much civil unrest. This is where Oscar Romero was gunned down while celebrating mass. This was when the sanctuary movement for congregations started out of Arizona. And UCC Wellington in Chicago was probably one of the first, if not the first church in Chicagoland that became a sanctuary church in the 80s. She shared how they were picked up in Tijuana by the federal police. And we know, unfortunately, the stereotype that federal police in Mexico have. You bribe them in order to get out. Think about that. 14 years old with your little brother and your mom is waiting for you in New York. You've left your country not because you wanted to, but because it's no longer safe. When Oscar Romero was gunned down, she said they couldn't talk about it, they couldn't mourn, because they risked death. Think about that. See, Oscar Romero is a saint because he fought for what Jesus calls us to do. He spoke out against the injustice. He spoke out of, against the status quo. And those are things that saints that come before us do. Now, not all of them will put themselves literally in front of danger. But they do things that make us remember them. In the tranquil town of Bethany, we witness a profoundly moving scene where Jesus is confronted with the devastating loss of his beloved friend Lazarus. Overwhelmed by grief, Jesus shares in the sorrow of those around him, revealing his profound compassion and empathy. This moment of heartache highlights the depth of his love and his ability to engage fully with human emotions. 
story takes a miraculous turn as Jesus performs the awe-inspiring miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. The extraordinary event transcends historical significance. It encapsulates a vital spiritual truth that resonates across generations. The resurrection illustrates that death is not the end. It is a passage through Christ we are offered the promise of new life. For those of you who took time to read the beacon by email that was sent earlier in, or late last week, or picked up a copy this morning, you'll notice that I talked about two very obvious topics, at least to me, while I was writing it. One is my dad. Two is what he taught me. And the reason I did that is one, for All Saints Day, and two, for Veterans Day. So if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to read how he balanced being a veteran and living his patriotic life, but separating it from his Christianity, from his spiritual faith, from his theological stance. And it's only a glimpse. I could write pages and pages of what he taught me. But it's an example of how the saints who have gone before us leave something for us. And sometimes it takes time to recognize it, but it's so embedded in there that all you have to do is take time, step back, and look inward. Miraculous act is a mighty reminder that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, embodying our ultimate hope in the faith of death. His authority conquers the grip of death, offering a profound assurance that through faith in him, we too can experience the transformative power of resurrection. In this way, the story of Lazarus inspires us to reflect on our own beliefs and embrace the hope that comes through faith in Christ. As Jesus calls Lazarus forth from the tomb, he extends its invitation to us. He calls us to rise from the spiritual death that sin and darkness impose upon our souls. He beckons us to embrace a new life characterized by hope, love, and eternal life. Reflect on the story of a young person trapped in a whirlwind of doubt and fear, feeling utterly lust, lost and isolated from the world around them. Life seemed overwhelming and they struggled to find their place or purpose. One day, during a moment of deep despair, they encountered Jesus. In that encounter, they were enveloped by his unconditional love and grace reaching into their hearts and souls. The deceptive moment marked the begin decisive moment marked the beginning of a profound transformation. With each passing day, they began to shed their insecurities and embrace hope. Like Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, this young person experienced a revival. To a vibrant new life filled with purpose, joy, and an unshakable sense of belonging. The darkness that once consumed them began to fade away, replaced by the light of faith and the promise of a brighter future. In the heart of a once promising young adult lay dreams and aspirations, however, shadowed by a series of poor choices that spiraled into a dark and destructive journey. The stark reality of their lives imprisoned them behind cold iron bars where they became painfully aware of crushing weight of lost freedom, severed family ties, and a future that seemed to slip further away with each passing day. Amidst the starkness of their surroundings and the profound despair that enveloped them, a flicker of light emerged, the transformative power of God's grace. With an earnest heart, they immersed themselves in the pages of the Bible, discovering comfort and guidance in its verses. Each scripture became a lifetime, drawing them away from their past and towards a glimmer of hope. Upon their release, the world awaited them like an unfamiliar landscape, filled with daunting challenges and opportunities for renewal. Driven by a deep desire for change, they sought a community of faith, a place where acceptance and understanding thrive. Embracing their newfound belief with seal, they began to construct their lives piece by piece. 
relying on the unwavering support of their faith community. Each small victory, each step forward, marked a significant stride on their journey toward redemption in a hopeful future. Now picture mature adults. Those are hard to find sometimes. They're heart heavy with grief and sorrow. Each day a struggle against the weight of life's many challenges. This one bright star in their soul seems extinguished, leaving them feeling lost and broken. Amid their despair, they discover profound solace in Christ, whose presence offers a warm embrace of strength and comfort. Transformative journey raises them from the depth of their pain, guiding them toward a new life filled with radiant peace and a refreshing sense of hope. These are not simply stories, they are compelling testimonies that vividly showcase the transformative power of resurrection. They illustrate how Jesus Christ can breathe, breath, breathe no life into even the most desolate and hopeless souls, revitalizing them with hope and purpose. As we gather to honor the saints who have gone before us, let us be inspired by their steadfast faith and love. May we commit ourselves to living in a way that honors God and spreads the love of Christ to those around us. Let us embrace the promise of the resurrection looking forward to the day when we will reunite with our loved ones and our Savior. Until then, let's dedicate ourselves to living intentionally, fostering love, and making a meaningful difference in the lives of others. May the hope of the resurrection fill our hearts with peace and purpose as we strive to reflect the grace and the value of the kingdom of God. Amen.